Welcome back. Today I want to help unravel the enigma that's inside this little case right here. Very, very mysterious. The shot shell, I did discuss the shot shell in a previous video not too long ago. Uh, and I discussed its performance and how it was made and things of that sort. But what I didn't discuss with you was how to replicate that enigma, how to un unravel the mystery that's behind all this uh, plastic. For so many years, you know, the, the shot shell has been cloaked in very, very mysterious terms. Uh, dream equivalency, uh, one and three quarter, uh, two and three quarter, number seven, three and three quarter, uh, one, and a, one and a half. You, you don't have a clue what's going on inside that shell just by looking at the numbers on the side without some sort of a uh, education. Now, <clears throat> that's all right if you simply go in a field because you know that this particular box of ammo works well on the pheasants that you go hunting. This particular box of ammo works well on the partridge that you go hunting. But when you try to replicate it, or for the loads that you take uh, to the trap range and shoot at clay pigeons, uh, you know, the factory stuff works fine. But after a while, you know, that thins your wallet out a little bit and you want to know how to uh, make your own. Most people uh, get along very well with uh, factory loaded uh, field loads because for the most part, most people don't chew through that much ammunition when it comes to hunting uh, for hunting ammo. Uh, but if you're, if you're a recreational target shooter, that's quite another thing. It's very easy to go to the range and to burn up uh, two rounds. Two, when I say two rounds, that's two rounds of 25 uh, per box. And that's, that would be two uh, sessions at the trap range or skeet house or which, whichever sport you indulge in. Uh, or even just going out to the meadow in the back, in the back pasture and launching birds from a trias trap or something like that. It's very easy to burn up two uh, two rounds of, uh, of shot shells. And when you really get involved with it, if you can find enough people that want to continue uh, through the day with you, you can shoot as many uh, rounds of trap as you want or rounds of skeet as you want. You, can, you might find yourself very, very enthused about it, shooting uh, four boxes of ammo uh, in the course of a week. That can get to be a drain on your finances unless you're you know, independently wealthy. So I want to try to help you uh, understand exactly how to replicate this enigma. This here is a, uh, this, this a see-through shell. This is a dummy shell that I got at the uh, Remington factory in Ilion, New York years ago when I was at the armor school there. Um, this is just used to uh, test uh, the function of uh, various guns, like an 870 shotgun and things. But you can see through this, you can see through this uh, clear wrapper here. This is exactly how uh, a shot shell is made. Uh, you can see this, the shot is contained in the upper section right here and below it there's a, if you look carefully you can see the outline of a uh, some sort of a support mechanism, a pillar or uh, a wad system that uh, is beneath the um, pellets and that sits, that resides right directly above the powder which is uh, would be if this was loaded with powder, it would be below that wad. So that's how it looks. That's how it looks inside, and most of them look very much like that, regardless of their, regardless of their power and construction. But <clears throat> there are vast differences in the terms of uh, the payload and the velocity and the internal construction that can really uh, be a, a significant uh, matter when it comes to reloading. The very first thing that you want to do when you uh, approach the issue of hand-loading shot shells, and I've mentioned this before, is that every hand-loader really needs to have a hand-loading manual. Um, yes, and I know that you can go online and you can very inexpensively download you know, certain information about uh, your hand loads, and I thank the, I thank the companies like Nosler and, and uh, Hornady and, and companies that are willing to you know, put published data online, uh, which basically is, is also found in their, in their uh, hardcover books. But when it comes to loading shot shells, it's an extremely uh, complex issue about uh, making sure that you have the correct components inside. I recommend, I hardly recommend uh, 
this is a this is a book that I consider to be the Bible of uh, shot shell reloading. This is the shot shell reloading handbook by Lyman. This is the fifth edi edition. Now I don't know if they have a more current edition than that at this point, but this seems to be current with all the components that I have found on the market so far. And that's the most important thing I want to uh, cover with you is that the component selection that goes inside those cases has to be specific. It has to be exactly as it's stated in the book. Now this sometimes comes off with, uh, with metallic cartridges as being some sort of a trite warning that people just can, you know, kind of blow off. So if they change the brand of primers, you know, uh, they might notice maybe a sticky bolt or maybe their chronograph will show a different velocity or something like that. Well, we're talking about a shotgun here. It's an entirely different beast. Shotguns, we sometimes call the barrels a tube. The, 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 the barrel steel is not, is not significantly thicker than the uh, paper towel tube that's hanging in your kitchen. Uh, it's, it's very, very thin metal there. Um, the, uh, the locking systems on most shotguns are designed to withstand pressures that are far, far less than uh, any metallic cartridge uh, rifle is uh, able to withstand. What sort of pressures are we talking about? If you're familiar with, if you're familiar with uh, metallic cartridges, you know that you know that the pressures can run, you know, forty thousand, fifty thousand, and sixty uh, sixty thousand plus. It's not unusual for modern cartridges to run sixty-two thousand uh, pounds per square inch internal pressure or copper units of pressure. Uh, but when we're talking about uh, a shotgun shell, high pressure shotgun shell. Uh, 10,900, that's it. That's a, that's a fourth, that's, that's a fourth or fifth of what most uh, over-the-counter um, metallic cartridges are. And that's not the mean average. The mean average runs around 9,000. So, and they, they run to as low as 7,000, uh, 7,800 and things like that. So it's an entirely different, entirely different uh, internal ballistic uh, pressure-wise. And so you really have to uh, adhere to it. Well, you might say that all things are relative. Well, there, there are, they are to a certain degree. But if you understand that the powders which are used in a shot shell are relatively similar to uh, the powders which are used in a pistol, they're very fast burning. Fast burning powders have very, very critical, uh, very, very critical uh, internal capacity uh, requirements. Just imagine if you accidentally uh, put a 357 Magnum uh, powder charge into a 38 special uh, case. You can see you can see how the, you know how the pressures would soar uh, way beyond the capacity of that 38 special uh, revolver and would certainly destroy it. That's exactly what can happen inside of a, a shot shell case. Let me show you what happens here. This is uh, this is just four of the uh, some of the common. Uh, wads that are found inside a uh, shotgun shell. This, this happens to be a Federal S4 and this one is designed primarily its main f function is to uh, the four means that it's a quarter ounce of shot. Now you can sometimes get loads that will uh, use as little as a uh, one and an eighth ounce of shot but it's primarily a, a one and a quarter ounce of shot and you can see it's a deep cup and they're all approximately the same height so don't be you know, don't be confused by that because even though this is this this is actually one of the uh, shortest case, this is one of the shortest wads in the entire pack, and yet it's got the deepest cup because that's the capacity of the of the shot. This one here is a Remington Figure Eight wad. That Remington Figure Eight wad has got a, a much higher positioned cup. Uh, it's shorter. This is made for, to replicate the. Uh, Remington factory loads which are used for target shooting for uh, trap loads and for uh, skeet loads, uh, clay, uh, sporting clays. This is called the figure eight wad but you can see it's a different construction entirely and it's got a different height, uh, it's got a different height uh, center column, that those support legs. And here you have, this is a Winchester, this pink one here is a Winchester light uh, wad. This one here holds only, it's, it's made to hold primarily one ounce of shot, That's a, so it can be less or slightly more, but it's primarily used for a, a light load with one ounce of shot. But you can see it's, it has 
one of its signature features it has a, a much taller support column in between here and I'll talk about that. This one here is your standard double A wad which is used by Winchester and all their double A, their top grade double uh, A target loads and you can see it has a, a shorter uh, support column and it's got a, a deeper but it's got a deeper cup. Now you say well don't they all do exactly the same thing? Yes they do. They, their, their, primary intent, their primary purpose is to not only support and hold uh, the shot and to protect it from abrasion going down the bore and to help cushion the, the water is there to uh, cushion the impact of the acceleration uh, to preserve the uh, roundness of the shot but the everything is engineered into that wad to occupy space within that case. The case itself the case itself uh, has specific dimensions internally. Externally they're all uh, relatively uh, the same. Uh, they vary very very little uh, when it comes to overall length and certainly the chamber dimension is the same from one brand to another. And by the way a, a two and three quarter inch a nominal two and three quarter inch uh, chamber. This case is actually a few you know it's, it, it's a couple of hundredths shorter than uh, that two and three quarter inches so that's a nominal number uh, but this internal construction is the part which you don't see and that's the part that can change the internal height of all the uh, the available height for the components and that varies from uh, not only from not only from brand to brand from Winchester to Federal to Remington and Cheddite all these other companies uh, but it can and, and Fiocchi it can also uh, change within a company's own production um, not for the same not for the same style of case but they make different they make different types of cases Remington for instance may use uh, his his three different there's three different case constructions. Here's, here's a modern Remington target load. Now this one here is made of, uh, it's a compression form plastic and it's all one piece plastic. It's got a, a solid brass head on it. Uh, it's a high quality case which is intended to be reloaded uh, many times and it's got, a, it's got a reloadable eight point star crimp on it which is uh, easy to uh, replicate on the uh, additional loadings. Uh, the plastic is, is uh, somewhat scorch resistant so it, it doesn't uh, continue to burn and uh, fray at the mouth. This one's already been reloaded I think about four times uh, so you can see it's, in, it's still in pretty good condition and it, I expect it can be reloaded a, a number of uh, times beyond this. Here's a, it looks very similar, it's got a, it's got a similar appearance on the outside uh, the brass is a little bit higher, but it's still this would be this would still be called a low brass case. Uh, but this case also has a uh, eight point star crimp. It can be reloaded. Uh, the internal construction, however, is different than you'll find on uh, that that gold colored case. The internal construction has got a uh, a paper base wad, a rolled paper base wad, and this this is not a brass head. This this head right here is actually brass plated steel and as I mentioned in a previous video it's in, the intention of the manufacturer is to assist this product in breaking down when it lands on the ground and, and out in the wild so that it won't last forever the, the brass head will immediately start to rust the, uh, the brass plating will rust through and the steel will deteriorate and uh, it, basically it, it will disintegrate. The plastic is also to a, a lower grade plastic which will uh, break down in exposure to the elements. So this is a this is a case which is substantially uh, weaker in in its ability to uh, be reloaded over and over again. This is although that can be reloaded and you can get a little bit of economy out of it if you uh, choose to uh, pick these up in the field. Uh, they're, they're not really intended for that purpose. This is a case which you can see it's got a different form of a crimp on the front. This is a high brass case. Uh, this is an old this is this is an old shell that uh, I have in my collection. Uh, it, it again it has a brass plated steel head on it that's intended to uh, break down. The uh, it, it's made without without that uh, that type of star crimp fold. You can see the the star is rather inverted. This shell is really not 
uh, easy to uh, reload because it's got a it, it's got a uh, burned center. The um, the center of it was melted so that it made it waterproof uh, for for being out in the field, which is a great aid for those who wish to uh, hunt out in the field and and keep their ammo uh, dry. But that comp uh, that that compromises its ability to be reloaded. You can't reload something once it's been broken through there. That won't hold hold pellets in the future very well. And that crimp is not something that's easy to uh, restore to its original form. So those are, those are some of the subtle differences. But the big thing is that the internal case capacity is uh, vastly different from one to the other. And when I say vastly different, you know, we're talking in terms of very fast burning powders and differences in terms of just two or three grains of powder capacity inside that case can uh, very seriously change uh, the, the dynamics of, uh, of the internal pressures. And the other thing that can change the dynamics of the internal pressures is the amount of pressure which is exerted upon uh, the powders, uh, especially on uh, slower burning powders, uh, and, and that, that has to do with the height of, the height of this uh, pillar that's in the middle here. If you if you're trying to put a lot of if you're trying to put a lot of powder under this particular wad right here, it's not going to happen. You're not going to have enough room to get much powder in there because it doesn't it doesn't it's not made to uh, give that much space. All these dynamics are very very subtle and they don't appear uh, to be important when you're looking at them on this stick here, but trust me, they they are enough to break a gun, uh, to wreck a, a very nice gun. Um, I have seen I have seen shotgun tubes that looked like a snake that just swallowed a rat. You know, there's a big bulge in the middle where uh, somebody fired a, a a shell that was simply uh, too hot for the for the uh, shotgun. Uh, I've seen uh, I've seen shotguns where I saw 1100, for instance, where the bolt just stripped right back from the locking recess in the uh, barrel and ruined the barrel. So uh, there, was a, there was a very expensive uh, barrel that was just uh, turned into trash immediately. So this is, it can happen just like that because, uh, and the reason why that, bar that barrel belonged to a friend of mine and the reason why that barrel suffered that damage was because uh, his brother-in-law had used a, just a different brand of shell. His, his habit was to just put all his shells back into a box and just continue to reload on his machine and uh, the, the, internal, the, the internal capacity of one shell to another changed and the load that was sufficient in one uh, batch of cases simply wouldn't work with another batch and it ruined a very good gun. So don't ever stray from the path when it comes to uh, shot shells. I really can't uh, stress that too much. Now I don't want to get into copyright uh, violations by uh, replicating any of this information on online here uh, showing published data but I can at least refer to it for you and I can show you what some of the uh, some of the things that uh, you can see in here I'll show you um, here's for instance the, some of the illustrations that they have are fabulous uh, because sometimes it's difficult to compare cases and know exactly what uh, sort of internal construction is there because even if you're looking down inside of a case with a flashlight or poking down in there with a pencil to see what the depth is, you really can't tell, for instance, that it has a uh, internal base wad like this or, or like this one or like this one. It, those are those are things which are those are things which are part of that uh, enigma that you just can't lay your hands on. So, what that manual do will do is the same as what uh, this free manual. This is a basic reloading manual that's available from uh, Hodgdon Powder. And this is a date, this is slightly dated, but it's still, it's still valued information. This is a 2015 version. But in the back of this, it's, it references uh, plenty, of, plenty of shot shell data uh, for all different gauges, uh, for all different um, shot shell lengths, uh, for, for different charges that can basically perform in any way that you want to tailor your load. Despite the mystery that occurs uh, with a shot shell and all the different, the, the, mul the multiplicity of loads that are available out there, it basically boils down to just certain uh, simple facts that you have to understand. I'm so glad that the industry has finally driven a stake through the heart of this uh, dram equivalent nonsense. 
Um, ever since about uh, ever since the the early part of the uh, 20th century, uh, long after long after shot shells went from uh, black powder to smokeless powder, and the modern smokeless powders took o took over. They invented this ridiculous term of dream equivalent, which was printed on all boxes, and it had uh, numbers such as dream equivalent of two and three quarter, dream dream equivalent of three, three and a quarter, three and three quarter. All these things. What did that mean? It just simply meant velocity. It, it was a it was a velocity figure, uh, and and experienced experienced shotgunners. Uh, got to know that a certain dram equivalent was the best type of thing to take pheasant hunting or duck hunting or target shooting or whatever. But they just didn't simply state the fact that this is this is a target load that's going at 1145 feet per second. Thank you very much. That's all I need to know. It's a target load going at 1200 feet per second. Thank you very much. That's what I really want to know. It's a, you know, a handicapped uh, target load, 1,300 feet per second. That's the important thing. So we've dispensed with this dram equivalency nonsense once and for all, and I, I, think it's, I think it's finally gone from the scene. But So you don't have to worry about dram equivalency anymore. If you have old boxes of shells, just understand that you can, you can find those dram equivalencies online and, and reference it, but I'm not going to talk about it any more than that. When you're dealing with uh, the, the next critical number is the, the capacity of uh, the actual weight of the shot charge. And some of this stuff is a duplication of what I said in a previous video on shot shells. But the, uh, the, the, the amount of shot that's available in a shot shell is largely dependent upon its bore diameter, that is its gauge, and naturally its length. So a, a two and three quarter inch 12 gauge shell has a different case capacity than a two and three quarter inch 20 gauge shell or 16 gauge shell, uh, and, and so it goes. Uh, three inch shells have a greater case capacity, can hold more shot. However, there's, a, there's quite a broad margin within, within a uh, given gauge. Uh, and the larger the gauge, the broader the margin. So, for instance, the 12 gauge, which is probably the 12 gauge, outsells all the others combined. Uh, there's no question about that. The 12 gauge shell has a case capacity that can very easily, with a standard two and three quarter inch load, it can easily go from seven eighths of an ounce of shot in increments of an eighth of an ounce, all the way up to uh, one and three quarter, uh, one and a half ounces of shot. So. Uh, it, it goes from seven eighths to one to one and an eighth, uh, one and a quarter, and one and three eighths of an ounce of shot, and, and then finally one and a half ounces. So you can have these magnum loads with uh, heavy charges, and that's all. It's all available in the same in the same package. Now, that's that's all dependent upon the uh, ability of the, the the case the the internal case capacity to house. Uh, the remaining components. So you've got the shot charge. That's a fixed. That's a fixed number. Well, it isn't really, and I'll talk about that. But that that capacity is a fixed figure. And then the the next thing that has to that has to drive that at a particular velocity is the amount of powder, uh, and that takes up a particular volume. So slower burning powders take up a greater amount of uh, internal volume, and Heavy shot, char uh, shot charges take up a larger uh, amount of that inter internal available uh, space. So it's actually, you know, it's actually straining at the bit and both it's trying to burn the candle at both ends because you're trying to get a heavier shot charge that fits in the same exact size case as a light shot charge to go at a fast velocity with slower burning powders that you need more of. So it's a big, big, it's it's a big conundrum how they can manage to get all this technology into uh, one size of a, a shell. But it's done very, very easily because the powder industry assists with all the different burning rates that go uh, like a rainbow up through uh, the scale. Now, it's a rather compressed, it's a rather compressed, uh, you know, burning rate in that in that category because it's like I said with, you know, there's overlapping of burning rates with pistols. A lot of, a lot of Powders. This one here is a this is famous red dot. It started out years ago with the Hercules red dot. Now it's the Lion powders. But it's it's um, this is a smokeless target shot shell powder. But this is also one of the more popular uh, 
pistol powders. This is also a very, very uh, good pistol powder for uh, cartridges like the uh, 44 Special and things like that for medium power loads. So it has, uh, most of your shotgun powders uh, have a dual, they have a dual life as, uh, as pistol powders and with published data that's available for them. But even though, uh, even though the breadth of the burning rates are right at the, at, at the bottom of the chart and very, very, uh, you know, very quick, they're very quick burning uh, in relation to uh, much slower burning rifle powders, they occupy a very small region, but within that region, uh, those small steps mean a lot. So, so a, a red dot powder burns faster than green dot powder, which burns faster than blue dot powder, and so it goes and it, and it continues to go up the chart with just that company alone, with just Alliant alone. And uh, as they become slower burning, they take up more space. That, that uh, allowance for space has to be accommodated by the wad. That wad is all important. So when, you, when, you're, dealing with, when you're dealing with the various components uh, in a, inside of a shot shell, you have to be mindful of the fact that every one of those components has to be uh, consistent with the other component. And they have to be tried and true. They have to be tried by a laboratory uh, that has measured the uh, internal uh, pressures of that uh, cartridge and you know that it's not going to blow your gun up. Now, how do you go about this? Well, again, without, without violating copyright restrictions here because it says you know you can't you can't um, duplicate this electronically or in any other way so I'm not going to try to I'm not going to bring this in to show you uh, you know any kind of specific numbers but you can see at the top of the page you just you just simply turn to two and three quarter uh, and then it will it will tell you uh, what is the load is uh, designed to fit into it designed, this, this whole page and this page is intended to fit into Chedite plastic cases. That's a brand of plastic cases and these are listed alphabetically. And there's also too, there's a, there's a sidebar here that says lead shot. So they, his, this, this book covers uh, bismuth and uh, heavy shot and uh, steel shot as well. So if I wanted to load federal cases, if I want to load federal cases, I simply turn to the federal page and it's two and three quarter inch and I work down from there. Then I'm starting to get into the specific data. First thing I do is I make sure that I have, I have the exact case that they describe and that's where that color illustration comes in because even though the colors may vary, a Winchester, uh, Winchester Western AA hull can be uh, bright red like it's been traditionally for years or it can be these these charcoal gray, these black ones. Um, and so don't necessarily go by color, but go by the description, the internals of the case. And if you're really in doubt, uh, all you need to do is just uh, take and, and saw one down the middle and take a look at the, the way it's made internally and then compare it to the uh, cutaway drawing. So, but usually that's not an issue. Uh, it, it will describe exactly what the type of case is. So if I wanted to, for instance, reload um, this Winchester AA hull and make no mistake that these these AA hulls and the Remington and the, the, the Federal Champion those are remarkable uh, remarkable in their ability to withstand a lot of punishment uh, you can you can shoot those over and over again and get your money's worth out of them uh, I, I compliment the industry for uh, not um, cheating us on that issue now but they also sell plenty of they also sell plenty of components. So <clears throat> let me see if I can find here uh, Winchester. It's all alphabetical, so it's uh, within reason. I should be able to find it pretty quickly. Um, so now I'm turning to Winchester. Uh, the name of that actual case is a compression formed case. So. What I'm looking to replicate is a one and an eighth ounce target load. A one and an eighth ounce target load is about standard in the industry. So what I'm going to try to do is just simply replicate a, a standard uh, target load for the same purposes that I would be uh, purchasing, say, at, at Walmart or uh, at, at uh, Bass Pro Shop or wherever. Um, now there are different there are different velocities uh, of 
target shells. Target shells can be uh, very low ball, light loads. They can go down below uh, 1,100 feet per second for, uh, say, young shooters, people who are sensitive to recoil. And that's a great part about a 12-gauge shotgun. You know, you can load a 12-gauge shotgun. It's a fairly, it's a fairly uh, heavy gun that absorbs a lot of recoil, for one thing. And if you give it to a youngster with a light load, he's actually going to suffer less recoil probably than if you gave him a 20-gauge shotgun that's made a lighter 20-gauge shotgun uh, with a standard field load. So, you know, don't ever, if, if, you're, if you're a mom and dad that wants to get your son or daughter a, a shotgun, uh, don't be afraid to get a, uh, like a, a micro Midas. Uh, browning or something like that, which is tailorable in size to a, a younger shooter and then can increase in you know size as, in, as the person grows up. Uh, because that, that shotgun with a 12 gauge bore is going to grow with him and he's not going to be he's not going to be suffering a lack of pattern out there. The, the more the more pellets you put out there, the, the easier it is to hit things. I think it's uh, people long ago, uh, I think it's less it, it's less popular these days, but at one time, it was a very popular notion to give a kid a 410 shotgun because he could handle the recoil. But the only problem is you can't hit anything with a. That's like trying to hit clay pigeons with a 22. There's not many pellets out there, and you know it's a very discouraging thing to give a kid a 410 shotgun and he can't he can't hit the same number of birds that you're hitting easily with your 12 gauge shotgun because you're handicapping the poor kid. So you're better off to get a 12 gauge shotgun that's got some heft to it. Put in a light seven eighths of an ounce load with a light low velocity charge, and he can have a blast. He can start hitting something. Um, so anyway, get I digress. Going back to uh, what I was talking about now. Now we're now we're. I don't want to verge on uh, violation of copyright here, but I'm into the Winchester HS or compression form plastic cases fold crimp, and that's and that's all I need to do. From working from there, now I'm down to one and an eighth ounce target loads. So I'm on the page that has one and eighth ounce target loads, and this is this is like I've hit I've hit pay dirt here because target loads occupies by far the uh, the, the broadest category of uh, loads because that's what most people do. Most most people who are reloading, you'll find that they're they're reloading for target shooting for for clay pigeons, and that's that's the big game. That's where you're chewing up uh, so much ammo. And I, I reload for everything. I reload for, for even for field use because it just bugs me to have to pay, you know, like $18 or more, $25 for a box of uh, field load. So I just simply buy a box of shot and make my own using target, using target hulls. The target hulls are extremely strong. They're stronger, actually, uh, than the field loads, uh, the field load cases. So, and I, and I recover them afterwards, too. Uh, but so if I go to one and an eighth ounce, target loads, uh, these, are, these are running in velocities of basically uh, sub 1,200 feet per second, around about uh, 1,145 to 1,200 feet per second, with some of them going below that, light field loads. Um, and uh, light field loads you can you know, load up especially with one ounce a shot or seven-eighths of an ounce shot. But in target load talk, 1145 feet per second is a standard target load. 1200 feet per second is a, uh, that's basically a, a light handicap load. That's a, that's a, a load that you can take back, uh, say to the 20 yard line or something, uh, trap shooting. They're a little faster. Uh, you can take uh, 1285, when you get up to the 1285s, those are your handicap target loads for, for trap shooting where you're going back to the fence, you're going back to the 27 yard line or something. So in other words, you're basically trying to get the pellets out there before the bird settles down in flight and it, and it hits the dirt. So you've got to get it out there and you've got to get it out there fast. Now those, those, small, those small increments don't sound like much. You're, you're, only, you're only stepping from, from 1145 to uh, 1280. That's, that's, not very, that's, that's not a very broad spread. But it, it's significant enough to mean uh, the difference between hitting birds and not hitting and, and, and not connecting. So those are the numbers that, that you want to keep in mind. So it's 11:45 for your standard having fun trap loads. Now, if you're just if you're shooting for economy and you want to just have a have a good time going out in the meadow uh, with your trap machine with your buddy, you don't need one and an eighth ounce of load uh, of lead. All you need is a one ounce. Uh, one ounce payload. You can save. You can save significantly on the amount of 
you get a free shot. You get a free shot for every eight rounds that you make using one and an eighth ounce, going down from one and an eighth ounce to uh, one ounce loads, and you can further decrease it going to seven eighths of an ounce load. It's very very easy to bust clay pigeon with your own trap machine with seven eighths of an ounce of uh, a bird shot. That's all you need. So your, your velocity levels are 1145 for a standard uh, loads, which you use skeet and trap, and uh, for uh, even for sporting clays. Sporting clays allows up to 1300 feet per second or more, but uh, trap doesn't. And, but it, the next step up from 1145 is to 1200, a little bit snappier, recoils a little bit more sensation, you're using up a little bit more powder, uh, then the next step up is the next official step up with the manufacturer is about 1285. That's all within the it's all within the ATA rules for trap. So those are the steps, and then your sporting clays. The, the sky's the limit. You know they they have loads that are 1300 uh, and and more. So, but if you want to if you want to load uh, your target loads, just pick your velocity, uh, or you can start right from the right from the beginning. You can see along the side here it lists all the different loads with red dot powder. I've got I've got red dot powder right there. So it lists, I think it's uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten loads it lists with red dot powder. It lists one, two, three, four, five, six, six of those ten uh, with Winchester 209 primers that I'm also using right now. And it doesn't make any difference which primary, primer brand that you use for shot shells, it, none in the least. It's just simply a, the spark plug that burns the powder. But it does, it does change the burning characteristics of the powder significantly. So don't ever make a change in your primers without consulting the manual and making the appropriate change there. Right from the, right, you can start all over again, change one item, start over again, go back to the book and, and get a different load. It's going to be different. Trust me, it'll be different. You don't want to destroy your gun and you certainly, at the very least, you're going to destroy the ballistic uh, performance that you were seeking. It's either going to be more powerful than you wanted or less powerful than you desired. So always consult the manual for any change whatsoever. Whatever the change is, the cases, the uh, powder, the primers, and the wads. And I'm going to talk about the shot in a minute. Now when it comes to uh, the next the next thing I have, I have either uh, Winchester double uh, I have Winchester double A wads, uh, the the uh, WAA 12s is the code name for them, the manufacturer's code name, and I've also got Remington figure eight wads. But there's a whole bunch of them that are listed for the the Winchester double A 12s. So those range in velocities from let me see, I got 11:35. That's pretty that's pretty close to that 11:45 uh, number. Uh, I've got 11:60 uh, with red dot. Um, these are CCI 209, then I Winchester 209 again, I, with Remington figure 8, I get 1163, that sounds very similar to the other, that's only 3 feet per second different than the other one, but there is a difference in pressure, one of them is 10.5 and uh, the other one is, is 10.6, not a significant thing, but it could mean a little bit of difference in recoil. Um, then I can move down to um, more RXP, RXP 12 uh, wads, which have different uh, pressures, but I can pick from any one of those red dot with the Winchester 209 primers uh, running between 1135 and 1160 and I'm golden and it will tell me specifically what the charge weight in this column right here it'll list a specific charge weight of uh, that red dot powder. What I do f with that number is I consult the back of that book or my mech chart Mech, all the different companies, Ponsness, Warren, Hornady, Mech, uh, whomever they are, Lee, they all have uh, various powder bushings that go into their uh, presses, and those powder bushings regulate the amount of powder, it's pre-measured amount, uh, determined by the size of the hole in the, in the uh, bushing. So a bushing, this is a, this is a Mech bushing, Mayville Engineering Company. Been around for quite a while. Um, and that fits into a shot charge bar. The shot, the shot charge is a fixed hole, which, uh, and this is a, this is a nylon, uh, this is a nylon uh, fixture right here, which uh, keeps the shot from binding. Um, 
but the bushings fit into a bar which has a fixed amount of shot. So this happens to be a one and a quarter ounce bar. My machine typically has a one and an eighth ounce bar for uh, for target shooting, for trap shooting. But that's how that that's how that's arranged. Those bushings are very, very inexpensive. I mean, you can you can buy an entire set of them, or you can just simply, if you're using just one load all the time, you can just simply buy one bushing and have at it, and never have to worry about others. And you can also get, if you're a person who uh, likes to uh, fiddle, I, to be honest with you, I think that I think it's a it's a pain in the neck. Um, you can get adjustable bars, which can adjust the amount of shot and uh, powder capacity. I've used, I've got one. Um, as far as I'm concerned, it, it's just too much work. Uh, I'd rather take the bar, it says one and a quarter ounce a shot. I, I throw that in. I throw the bushing in that I want. I've got about 15 different bushings and they're very inexpensive. I throw the bushing in that I want. I get the shot tried, bang, I'm done. With the other thing, I'm, I'm standing at my scale, measuring, adjusting, measuring, adjusting. It's just not worth the effort to me. Uh, but, you know, some people like those, but that's another thing. Uh, there are also there are also uh, bushings that you can get that bu I should say baffles that you can get to go underneath your powder uh, dispenser that will regulate a little bit more uh, precisely the amount of powder they have they have little steps inside that regulates the amount of uh, powder pressure that's uh, put on top of the powder. I've never really had any interest in in worrying about that. I've had I've been shooting I've been shooting these things for for 45 years. Uh, without any uh, issues whatsoever, and uh, I've tested the velocities. They're they're they're, they're consistent enough for my uses. Um, but those are good things to consider. I mentioned though, a shot. <clears throat> shot comes in. Shot comes in 25 pound bags like this. Sometimes they're packed. You know, some of the higher grades of shot, uh, or the uh, larger sizes of shot, are sometimes packed in. Uh, you know, smaller quantities, but 25 pound bag is about typical. And that, that, 25, that 25 pound bag can be in three types of shot generally. That one there is marked magnum shot. The softest, the softest shot is called uh, just shot or, or soft shot, and it's made primarily of pure lead. It may have a little bit of other alloy in it, but it's primarily a pure lead pellet. They're very, very soft. They're easily damaged in flight. Um, they, have, they have very, very short range capability, uh, they, but they are uh, greatly uh, preferred for people who shoot woodland uh, wood, for instance, woodcock, partridge, or anything like that, where you want a spreader pattern, where you want to have that pattern spread out in a hurry. You're not going to go far because those pellets are going off uh, crazy, uh, like a bunch of knuckleballs. They flatten and all sorts of things ba badly. But that deformity causes them to spread open real, real quickly, and it, and it's a great asset for somebody who's trying to, you know, down a partridge that's only, you know, 15 to 20 yards away before he, uh, before he gets out behind the bushes. The next level is called chilled shot. That's a common, that's a common uh, mixture of uh, antimony and lead uh, that creates a harder shot, which uh, it resists deform deformation. And that's sometimes it's called field shot. That's a, that's a shot that's used in standard grade uh, hunting ammo that you might buy. A lot of the bargain ammo that you, that you might buy uh, stuff that's that's marked like game loads and things like that. The less expensive line of um, uh, ammo that's sold by Winchester and Remington and Federal. Those are the those are the ways they cut back on the price of the of of the uh, ammo is by uh, having a, a a slightly uh, less quality shot. The best kind of shot is non-plated shot, I should say. The, the best is this magnum shot, or also called extra hard shot. That's what you'll find in your premium uh, target ammo. Premium target ammo will always have extra hard shot, and, it's, and that shot really resists uh, deforming terrifically. It's also the, the stuff that's found in the name brand, the, the, the flagship line of uh, you know, ammunition. For instance, if you're buying uh, Remington, uh, if you're buying Remington ammo with the, 
the green packaging or something like that. That's, that's, the, that's the standard fare for uh, high grade uh, hunting ammo. They're using extra hard shot. <clears throat> those are those are the only those are the only pellets you should buy when it comes to uh, loading for target use for anybody who's shooting in competition on the trap range or anything like that because it's the only one that's going to consistently reach out uh, to the to those longer birds uh, when they're when they're flying away. Remember, a trap a trap is flying constantly away from you, uh, and you know your job is to intersect that in flight, intercept it. So. The next level going up is uh, very, they, they can double the price. Every one of these steps up increases the price of the shot. So magnum shot or extra high shot is the, the highest price uh, for, the, for the standard black shot. But the next one up from that would be uh, copper plated or sometimes nickel plated shot, which uh, greatly uh, makes that even more superior when it comes to uh, deformation and penetration, game penetration. So that's found in many of your uh, premium loads for, uh, game, uh, for game hunting. But I don't, uh, the, the important thing to remember is that as the density goes, uh, as, the, as the density goes up, the quality goes down. For instance, a, a pure lead shot is the most dense shot of all. But that means that it has the fewest pellet count. So sometimes I've seen people uh, write, write into blogs and, and you know, complain that one, one batch of shot they got, they don't get as much uh, pellet count as the other batch. Well, they actually, there's another problem going on. The, the, it's a sh it, that shot that's not giving them as many pellets is also a, a softer shot, which is not as good a quality. So as the shot quality goes up, the hardness goes up, and as the hardness goes up, the pellet count goes up because they're less dense. The pellets weigh less in order to take up, take up the same amount of uh, weight. There's greater volume, so all those things are factored into it. Uh, but when you're when you're dealing with the when you're dealing with the data, which is uh, found in 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 these books right here, this is all calculated according to uh, nominal charge uh, weights, and it's it's typically calculated along uh, the lines of extra hard shot. So uh, it's a wor it's, these, these are published with the worst case uh, scenario. So er everything is going to be copacetic. You don't have to worry about it. Um, I think I've pretty well covered uh, most of what I wanted to cover uh, with regard to uh, the components that are used for, uh, for shot shells. The, the cases, uh, make sure you don't mix them up. You never, ever, ever mix cases. I told you what happened with my buddy's shotgun. Don't ever mix cases as you're, as you're loading. Keep them segregated. Uh, and when you change from uh, Winchester to Federal or Federal to Remington, make sure you consult your data and go to different data. It has to be different data that specifically states those cases with the specific primers. Primers, it doesn't make any difference which brand you buy, buy any kind of 209 primer that you want. These are, by the way, battery cup primers. They're a little differently uh, constructed than a metallic cartridge primer. You can see it's a, it's a uh, copper cup, a deep copper cup, and it's got a, uh, it looks like a metallic cartridge primer that's situated inside that. But that's, that's the name of the game with these. They're typically called 209 style primers. And it doesn't make any difference, but they, they all have the same number, but they don't all do the same thing. They have different flash, they have different fl uh, flash brightness, brilliance, whatever you want to call it, flash temperatures. And they alter the way the powder burns inside. A hotter primer acts like more powder. It, it, it acts as if it was uh, more powder thrown into that charge. And cooler primers act like uh, just the other way around, like less powder. So you really have to be uh, attentive to those details. Uh, wads, buy the wads which satisfy your requirements. Uh, you know, d don't just go to the store and, and buy a bunch of uh, Federal S4 primers, uh, wads rather, and find out that when you get home that those are all for uh, quarter ounce and heavier loads. Uh, one and a quarter ounce and heavier loads when what you're trying to make is seven eighths and one and an eighth ounce loads. So uh, buy the buy the wads that are appropriate to the task, and they come in they come in these bags of 250, um, and they're they're relatively inexpensive. This 
these these bags are they state on them what uh, you know what they can be used for and even though they're even though their nominal uh, feature design might be for a one ounce load they they have a spread of uh, from seven eighths of an ounce even up to an, an ounce and an eighth so you know they have they have that flexibility so when you consult your data, if you're if you are a person who's going to be loading for different types of sports or for different guns, maybe some for your for your your son or daughter, and some for your wife, and some for you, try to try to scan the data and find the the components which fit the broadest range of categories and uh, the the broadest range of uses. So uh, different powders, for instance, have. Uh, different ranges of uses. Red dot powder is really it's a target load powder. It can be used for light field loads and things like that and, and, and very light um, target loads but it's not a very good powder if I was seeking to make uh, pheasant loads where I need to drive the velocities of a, you know, high velocities of heavy payloads. It's not the appropriate powder for that and then I wouldn't be I wouldn't be using the same wads either. So everything has to be according to Hoyle. So the best way to pick out your components is to first of all get a book like this and scan the scan the data and uh, fi find out uh, assemble in your mind what it is that you want to do uh, and how and how many different guns and scenarios you want to load for and and pick the combinations of uh, internal components that will best satisfy those needs and sometimes you can't it's, there isn't really a one size fits all solution to this but you know I find that through the years uh, there's, there's certain things that do work for a, a broad range of things that I'm doing so that's about all I have to say on this issue for the time being I do want to talk about uh, the, the press itself give you some mechanical instructions on how to set that up and and to and to get loading but I hope now that at least you have an understanding of uh, how these things are built and now that we've unwrapped that enigma. Take care, thanks for watching, spread the news about us and subscribe. God bless.